Excellent. Okay. So we have lots of great um, introductions happening in the chat. If you haven't opened the chat, that is definitely worth scrolling through. Uh, great turnout. Thank you all. This is the first webinar for the 2021 school year for CCC OER, and we are really fortunate to have um, a great panel that's going to be talking about decolonizing the course. So a great topic, great panel to start off this school year. The plan for today's session, oops, there we go, is to, um, we'll do a quick bit of introductions first, then we'll introduce what, what we mean by decolonizing the course. Then we'll hear from our um, three speakers and we'll have a little bit of Q&A time between each, um, each speaker and as well at the end if we have um, time to do that. In the interim, if you put questions in the chat, I will take notes of those and bring them to our speakers when there's time to answer them. So chat is a great place to ask questions. Could you our please make the, for, oh, could you sorry. please make this record? Um, yes, we will be recording this and the, uh, it'll be posted on the website as well. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Okay, our speakers for today. Um, Justine Hope Blau has been teaching a memoir writing workshop at Lehman College in the Bronx since 2015. In 2020, she published an anthology of her students' compelling memoir vignettes, My Slipper Floated Away, which is available for free on the CUNY Academic Commons. Justine has sold and optioned screenplays and has written three nonfiction books three nonfiction books, including her memoir, Scattered, um, Hand Whistle Press 2012. Her writing has been published in Rolling Stone, Oprah Magazine, CBSnews.com, and the Huffington Post. She holds an MFA in screenwriting from Columbia Film School, has raised two kids, now grown, and is obsessed with saving our democracy. Um, Heather Blau, as of August, has become the coordinator of library services for two campuses at Reynolds Community College in Richmond, Virginia. Before arriving at Reynolds, Heather spent six years in positions focus, focusing on online learning and OER. Recent highlights of her work include working on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at Southern New Hampshire University and developing an embedded library program for a large distance learning population at Northern Virginia Community College. Heather has presented locally and nationally on the topics of OER and distance librarianship and is the 2017 recipient of ACRL's Distance Learning Librarianship Award. Most recently, Heather was selected to be a curriculum designer and presenter for ACRL's OER and Affordability Roadshow. Joe Brinkert is a math teacher and former instructional coach at Front Range Community College, the largest community college in Colorado. This campus is spread from North Denver metro area up to Northern Colorado. Joe worked with a group of math teachers across the state on a grant through the Colorado Community College System and the Center for Urban Education to explore achievement gaps for racial and ethnic minorities in math classes. When he's not focused on his class and students, Joe keeps busy with two kids, a tween, and almost tween, um, and keeps them from killing each other, which is always a, a task, I'm sure. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. A little bit of background about CCC OER, which is the group that puts on these monthly webinars. Um, the Community College Consortium for OER is a community of practice dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of open educational resources to enhance teaching and learning. We are founded to support the community college mission of open access through creating awareness and development of openly licensed, low-cost educational materials to make college more affordable and accessible for all students. We provide regularly scheduled online and face-to-face -face workshops for faculty and staff who are engaged in OER projects. Uh, CCC OER has 93 members across 36 states, and we would like to um, welcome our newest member, Angelina College in Texas. So thank you. 
before we jump into our presentations, we did want to spend just a little bit of time discussing what we mean when we say decolonizing the course. And what this is really focused on is undoing the, um, the legacy of colonialism that has brought us to where we are today. So a little bit about uh, colonialism, right? It is uh, based on assumptions of a cultural hierarchy, right? The assumptions being that some cultures are um, superior to others, and that is why colonialism um, is a valid approach. And it's, it's also the foundation of our current culture. And while we have moved away from some of these assumptions, and our educational systems have evolved, many of the assumptions of colonialism have remained in our curriculum. Uh, some hidden, some less hidden, but a lot of them are there and we may not even see them. And so the idea of decolonizing our course is that we are agreeing to take on an active and ongoing process that requires a few different uh, components. One is we as educators are dedicated to identifying and unlearning the assumptions that we have picked up um, as, as we went through our educational process. Because those hidden assumptions are things that we absorbed as we, um, as we went through our, our um, education. We are also um, dedicated to seeking and hearing marginalized voices. So those voices that we may not have heard in the past or those that are generally not heard, and I mean heard with a capital H, right? Voices that are generally not heard, we not only listen, but we also seek them out. And more broadly and more holistically, um, agreeing to dismantle systems of oppression as we find them and can do something about them. So that's just a little bit about the, the concept that started us down this path of decolonizing the course. Okay, and with that, um, Justine, it is, it's all you. Hi. I teach memoir workshops at Lehman College in the Bronx, and I'm here because I published this collection of my students' me memoir collection, uh, me memoir essays, on the CUNY Academic Commons. It's called My Slipper Floated Away, New American Memoirs. When I started teaching five years ago, I realized that my students didn't always appreciate how compelling their own stories were. They wrote about growing up hearing gunshots and sirens at night, playing basketball, using fire escapes as their hoops. And many of my students are Dominican and they would talk about dancing at Thanksgiving. It's just a concept I never thought of. One student wrote about how he and his brother fended for themselves when they were only 11 and 14 years old after their father was deported. At first, I thought my students needed to read classic memoirs so they'd have mainstream cultural references and show how educated they were. And so I put The Writers Club on the syllabus by Mary Carr, This Boy's Life. But quickly I saw how much they appreciated reading memoirs whose lives they could relate to. Ta-Nehisi Coates' memoir, The Beautiful Struggle, is one of those. So my students love that he is a journalist, an author, he won a MacArthur grant, but he also wrote the first Black Panther comic book. When we would parse his language, they would see how he combines scholarly reading with ghetto phrasing, and that excited them. It showed them that their own stories have a place in American culture, and that opened them up to the pleasure of using literary techniques to create artful narratives. We always read an excerpt from Charles Blow's memoir, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. He grew up poor in rural Louisiana. His mother worked in chicken farms while going to school and becoming a teacher. He is a distinguished New York Times journalist who has bravely written in his memoir about bisexuality and is always a warrior against white supremacy. He is such a relevant memoirs for my students to be reading. One of my students um, told me that she even got all her friends to follow him on Twitter 
And I, I just think that's very powerful. Um, here's an anecdote from last year. I learned two of my Muslim students would politely excuse themselves in the middle of class to go pray. And they missed a lot of class time. So I wanted to handle the situation sensitively. So I talked to a Muslim chaplain, Amina Darwish. She explained that Muslim students had to go to another building to pray in a safe place. So I asked the English department if my students could use the copier room on the same floor as our classroom to pray and they readily agreed. It cut down on their time away from class. And the chaplain also gave me two travel sized prayer rugs to give to my students. They were so appreciative of this gesture and it really helped to establish trust in the class. Decolonization is about taking power back and I interpret that broadly. In the Bronx, there's a shortage of mental health providers. So I always encourage my students to take advantage of free counseling at college. And I tell them this may be their only chance to get free therapy and everyone should have it. Trauma comes up a lot with my students. Some students left behind trauma in other countries when they moved here, only to face staggering difficulties in America. Barriers to unemployment, drug laws that target non-white people. Some of my students, many of them, grew up with parents who worked long hours in menial jobs and had long commutes to work. So in every class, my students bonded over their efforts to transcend trauma, especially through the power of storytelling. So this summer, after two years of work, I, I published the anthology, um, My Slipper Floated Away, New American Memoirs, on the Manifold platform. That's a platform used by CUNY. And during the process, I had a librarian come and do a session with my students to teach them about copyright. She explained all the possibilities to them. They listened carefully, took it very seriously, and they agreed to allow open access for non-commercial use. So just to clarify, my students had agency over how their life stories would be distributed. The process of publishing on the Academic Commons was arduous. I thought it would be as simple as posting a PDF on the Academic Commons. It was not. It, there was a lot of formatting, filtering. Um, and I know a lot of librarians are in the audience today, and I, I just wanted to say I think it would be great to establish a system of paying maybe computer science students to help people who want to publish on the Academic Commons. I would actually gladly have paid out of pocket to get some help. <laughs> But the a librarian at, at Lehman, Stacy Katz, was extremely helpful to me. Um, my students can now cite that they've been published um, on the academic commons in their CVs, on their grad school applications, and for job applications. So we're, they're very proud of it, and I'm proud of that. Please feel free to use these stories. If you know ESL teachers, they can use these stories as reading material for free. They're fresh perspectives. And we think millions of people will enjoy reading them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justine. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it is a beautiful book. I, um, thank you for sharing that with us. We have a few moments. If anyone has questions, feel free to unmute or we can save them for the end. But while folks are processing, I did want to give you a chance to ask questions. Well, we will have time at the end um, as well. So Heather, I think I am going to um, turn it over to you, but there is one quick question. Can the hyperlink be pasted in the chat? Absolutely, I will do that as, um, as we turn this over. Um, okay, stop sharing.
Okay. Actually, um, Layla, I see your, your hand is up. Sorry, Heather, not to jump in. Um, did you have a question? Layla? Actually, yes, I'm sorry, uh, not to interrupt, but I did have a question for Justine um, about the, uh, the age range of her students and um, the, uh, how decolonization, is it addressed within some of the essays as well? Um, so those are just a couple of questions. My students range from 18 to 40s, mostly 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about your question. Can you ask that again? How is decolonization addressed in their essays? Um, yes, um, you know, because some, some students uh, may be coming from uh, colonized countries. Did that, does that factor into how they interpreted their situations? Um, either way, they sound fascinating. I was just curious. Sure. It's yeah. so varied. I have students who, in their home countries, may have had servants. Mm -hmm. And then they come here, and it's such an adjustment to be, to be at the bottom of the hierarchy in America. I have mm -hmm. students who grew up here, but just don't realize um, all the resources available to them. Mm -hmm. So it's... The whole Black Lives Matter movement is is very much on their minds, and I I I tell them that we're in the middle of a golden age of of African American intellectualism, and I want them to be aware of it. Also, you know, all kinds of writing of people of color. It's a very exciting time, and at the same time, they my own students are just becoming. Many of them are only just becoming aware of their power. I don't know yep. if that answered your question. It does. Thank you. It sounds great. It sounds like it'd be a good model um, for inspiring our own students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Does it look okay, Una? Yep, we can see it. Great. Thanks. Great. Uh, my name is Heather Glicker, and I'm the coordinator of library services at Reynolds Community College in Richmond, Virginia. And um, basically, um, I'm here to talk about. Um, well, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, opportunity. I, I like to start with a standard plea to include librarians in your OER initiatives. And I was so grateful to hear Justine talk about how she included um, her librarian uh, in, in her initiative, because uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're here for. And I think one of the most important roles of a librarian is being the link between resources and the people building courses. Um, so don't forget about your librarians, include them. We would love that. Equity is about the money. Your institution probably has a video similar to this one that I created for Northern Virginia Community College a couple of years ago. And, you know, in these videos, you talk to students and you find out, um, you know, the extraordinary amount of money that they spend on textbooks. And, and the point of these videos that you see all over the internet is that OER will make the cost of college equal for all students by um, eliminating the cost of textbooks and thus eliminating hardship. And we use these videos to market OER initiatives to the institution. The financial aspect of equity was and is one of the strongest reasons OER has become a powerful movement in higher ed. We're eliminating or extremely reducing the costs associated with taking college courses and we don't want the financial cost of textbooks to negatively impact student success because they can't afford a textbook. Um, and then they end up, you know, relying on using a library copy uh, or borrowing a classmate's copy or deciding not to take a course at all. But equity isn't just about the money. In this sense, 
Equity means treating each individual according to their needs. It's about meeting the individual needs of students so that everyone can attain the same. So if we're looking beyond the financial aspect of equity and we're thinking about intentional design, we're moving into the territory of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not an easy one-size-fits-all fix. And working with teaching faculty and teams of instructional designers over the years, uh, you realize that the challenges can be overwhelming to tackle all at once when you're building a course. You know, there are deadlines and daily responsibilities um, that you're dealing with. And so, you know, often working as a support to these groups, I would hear firsthand the frustrations in trying to produce a course with equitable, equitable content and still meet all of those deadlines. What I started seeing was the same stock photos being used over and over again, and they weren't representative of the student population. Though unintentional, no matter where your institution is, one would hope images used within courses represent some kind of diversity, whether that be race, gender, ability, or size. So I say start small, and if you can't do anything else, start with images so that when a student opens their online class for the first time, they don't see the same stock photos that stereotype who students are and what they're meant to look like. This is a short activity that was actually presented during the CCC OER webinar in November of 2017 by Dr. Daphne Sikri. And I've made sure to link to the webinar here so you can go back and see how she presents it. What I'd like you to do, if not now, is at some point, open a new tab or use a mobile device and go to Google and then type hug or hugging and then click images to filter out everything else and see what results you get. Our searches may all yield different results, but what, what I see are attractive people, some of diverse backgrounds, but mostly Caucasian. Now, when we go to an open access image repository like Pixabay and many, many others out there and type in the same search, what results do you get? Again, I see attractive people, mostly Caucasian, maybe even less diversity than in the Google search. And this is when I decided to reach out to the CCC OER advisory email group and ask if anyone had come across image repositories focused on representing people of diversity to add to my running list that I was keeping. And while there are numerous content built sites with filtering capabilities to assist in narrowing the search, I wanted to find more dedicated sites. And I've linked to the resulting blog post with a list of the links here, as well as um, I've got all of the links in a separate slide later. And these are some of my favorite repositories. Uh, the Gender Spectrum Collection features images of trans and non-binary models that are authentic, and you'll hear this word come up over and over, and go beyond the cliches of putting on makeup or holding trans flags. This collection aims to help media outlets better represent members of these communities as people not necessarily defined by their gender ident identities, but people with careers, relationships, talents, home lives. Uh, they also have a very thorough and thoughtful guidelines section on how to avoid implicit bias, which I think should be recommended reading for anybody uh, building courses and using images. Another one is the Disabled and Here website, and it talks about media portrayals of disability being one-dimensional and framed either through the lens of pity or inspiration form. The creators want to reclaim how they're depicted and feature disabled people with different diagnoses or lack of, different body types, sexual orientations, and gender identities um, who all reside in the Pacific Northwest. And it's um, also categorized. So we have LGBTQ plus themed, lifestyle, social, and work. And all 
Vivo Plus Size has a similar focus to present those authentic images, ones where plus size people are, quote, doing normal things and existing. Aldo makes a compelling plea that even though the attribution isn't required to use the photos, they ask that you give credit whenever possible so that others may find the collections. And this is something that I've started doing consistently, hoping that these clicks will lead to continued content creation. So, um, you know, no matter what um, open access image repository I'm using, I link back to it and I use the title of, of, the, of the page. And that way I can very easily let people know where these uh, images are coming from and, and show my support to the creators. And this is a slide with all of the DEI focused image repositories um, that I've found thus far. And of course, they're always changing. There are always new ones out there um, that, I, that I'm being made aware of. And then unfortunately, there are ones that disappear off of the list because uh, they decide to start charging for the images um, or they uh, just disappear because of lack of support. So um, as I started my, present, my uh, part of the presentation, um, I would just like to say thank you for everyone who includes librarians because we really do want to be a part of these uh, initiatives and we want to be there to support everyone building forces. And this is one way that we can do that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. There were um, some really great comments about people trying out this search in the chat and some of the results that they were getting. Uh, oh, if there were questions, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. So different people are getting different results. I think part of that has to do with um, previous searches. Um, were there questions that I'm missing? If you have a question, you can retype it or raise your hand about the image searches. And there were a few more links to resources in the chat that was that are pretty cool. Yeah, and, and I encourage everybody, if you're not a member of the, the CCC OER advisory group email, to join them because um, if we, the more that we share these, the better, right? And, um, you know, I, I don't want to be the keeper of the lists, you know? So if we all, if we all share these, these image repositories, um, they will catch on and get support and, you know, more people will know about them. And I believe, um, Una, we're going to be sharing these uh, um, slides, right? So that everyone can have access to the, the links. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Those will be posted within 24 hours on our website. Okay. Um, yep. And I think other than just uh, kudos for, for the list, and I agree with everyone that was saying that um, this is my go-to when I look for pictures because otherwise it, it's hard to find um, images that represent our students. So yeah, thank you, Heather, for, for starting us on this discussion and creating that list. Um, okay, so Joe, I think it is, uh, it's, it's you. All right, thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Joe Brankert, and I'm a math teacher. I almost feel like I'm like intruding in here uh, <laughs> on, on all, all of these literary discussions. Um, but really, I'm here to talk about my experiences working with uh, the Center for Urban Education out of the University of Southern California. Um, about three years ago, I was fortunate enough, enough to be a part of a grant um, that, that we had with uh, through the community college, the Colorado Community College System to really evaluate our achievement gaps in our math classes throughout the state. And, um, and, and so when we first met with the representatives from Q, um, not the letter Q, but C-U-E, it took me a while to kind of recognize that, but um, when we first met with them, one of the first things they talked about was uh, our syllabus. And, and I found that a little interesting because um, I, I had not really given my syllabus much thought. Um, I, I've been teaching at the community college for 12 years. Um, you know, it, it's been increasingly more of a, 
of an administrative document, something I have to do. It's been mandated and, and, and really standardized almost throughout the whole state. Um, and, and just with very kind of formal language and, and something that, that most students didn't really read, it used more as a reference document to you know, find particular uh, information. Um, and, and I mean, at this point, it's, it's now gotten to the point where it's 10 to 11 pages long with all of the necessary verbiage um, for, for all of the class. And if you look here on this slide, I've got an example of the, the start of my, uh, one of my syllabi for one of my classes this semester over here on the left. Um, and, but in talking with Q, I realized that really, I mean, the syllabus is one of the first documents. It's one of the first things that we talk about in our semester and how important first, uh, first impressions are and realizing that if I'm using this document and I'm speaking with this, uh, that, that very formal document is saying an awful lot about my views of our class and kind of setting a tone that really, I, A, I hope I, I did not continue throughout the semester, and B, not really one that's very welcoming, uh, especially of people who, who are maybe first generation, people who, who do not or are not used to um, the trappings of formal education and, and, you know, kind of that type of environment. And so I realized that mm, I, I can't change the syllabus. I, I have to have one of those. Um, and I have to, I, but I don't have to pass it out. I don't have to really highlight it for my classes. And so my kind of aha was recognizing that, you know what, I need to have that on my learning management system. And I need to point that out to my students that that is a reference for them to be able to look at if they have questions. But in the majority of cases, there's really only a few things that my students need to reference in there regularly throughout the semester. And I could pare all of that down and, and really make it much more, of a, uh, much more of a mirror document as opposed to a window document. So it, it, write it in a way and, and bring images in in a, in a way so that students are seeing themselves in it, as opposed to um, further kind of uh, further reinforcing that idea that you know that that maybe they don't belong, maybe this isn't for them. And so, um, what you see on the right is is one of my welcome, what I call welcome documents, right? I, I feel like there's a big difference between syllabus and welcome, um, and and that's what I label this document on the right is. It is my welcome document, and um, this is one side, and then on the back side is our schedule of classes, and that's it. Um, you know, that's kind of how we start off our class. Um, and as you can see, you've got one of those stock photos there in there, but it does represent different, uh, you know, people of different backgrounds. And 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 one of the biggest um, sections, if you notice, is that quote down on the bottom right, and. And I know a lot of you in the chat were talking about um, the difficulty in finding images uh, that reflect our student populations. Um, it is very difficult as well to find uh, quotes by people about math that um, are not from like old white Greek guys. Um, and so if you, if you see down here, uh, actually this class attracts a lot of um, a disproportionate number of Latina students. And so um, in, in this case, I use a, a, a quote from um, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, uh, sorry, uh, Ochoa, who um, was the first Latina to go into space. So, um, you know, really kind of wanting to start our class off on that right foot and, and welcome students right away. Um, but then recognizing that we have we have 15 week semesters that, you know, it's, it's great to make that first impression, but really needing to um, continue with that throughout the semester. And that's where kind of looking at the overall structure of what we're doing in the class throughout the semester um, and making sure that that mirrors my um, beliefs and sorry about that. Um, but, you know, mirrors my, my, 
thoughts with uh, wanting to decolonize this course and, and give that power back to the students, create this environment where um, we are constructing this knowledge together, that it is not an authoritarian, I am the sole dispenser of, um, of knowledge, but that we are, uh, as a community, really building what we're talking about here. And that can, um, one of the powerful ways that I've kind of looked at this is creating a, almost a semester long uh, list of all of the assignments, everything that I'm asking my students to be writing out and doing, um, including all of the assessments, and, and looking at each and every one of my students and how they are progressing in those assignments to see if there are any sort of patterns with traditionally minoritized students and how they are responding in these uh, assignments and in these assessments. Also looking at what types of assessments, not just going back to, well, when I was going through school, right, I had to take these tests and they, you know, had to be this particular way. Um, or looking at, you know, kind of this test has to be, you know, it, it is, is what your grade is and it tells you what, um, you know, kind of what your level of knowledge is. But no, recognizing that, that, if, that if we truly feel like we, uh, we want to instill a growth mindset in our students and encourage them to work harder and to learn from their mistakes and really grow, that having a test on September 16th where that grade can have an outsized impact on your grade at the end of the semester on December 14th and have that say your level of knowledge on these learning outcomes can be very detrimental and actually almost reinforce the idea of a fixed mindset and that um, and, and, and you know kind of without even I, I, I feel like Suzanne's definition of decolonizing decolonizing a, 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 a course at the beginning, um, you know, really kind of put that into perspective of, you know, kind of that, um, you know, just kind of implicit way that education can bring those biases in and, um, and, and really kind of us as instructors making it incumbent on us to make intentional choices that will, um, that will really help uh, our, our minoritized students become part of this atmosphere and really thrive in that community. Um, and so if we look at that community, kind of looking at it, not from that entire semester, but now bringing it down into the classroom and what that classroom looks like. And uh, this next slide actually shows an example of a classroom uh, observation that uh, a few of us math teachers at our community college did some observations of our classrooms. And rather than the more typical observation forms that really focus almost like a checklist on, you know, what did the teacher do? Did the teacher do this? Did the teacher do that? Um, really, this observation worksheet is designed for the observer to really be focused on the students. Um, so if you look, each circle over here, this is basically a layout of the classroom, and each circle represents one student and where they are sitting within the classroom. And if you notice at the top of each circle, it says R-E -E or, or race or ethnicity, then gender and age. And all of these are perceptions. It's our, you know, perceived, how the observer is perceiving these, um, which, which is how, you know, it, in, in many ways, our society might be perceiving these students, right? And so being able to look at not just where are our students in the class, but what are the patterns with certain uh, race and ethnicities and genders and ages as far as where they're sitting within the classroom. Um, and then if you notice also, there are, uh, there's a little kind of, um, legend up here in the right of uh, the asterisks are basically meaning when a student is raising their hand, when they are engaging in the whole class discussion uh, with the instructor, 
And, and I mean, invariably what ends up happening is those asterisks are all clustered right here, right in the middle. If you notice the instructor is over here on the left. So these right here are in the front center, right in front of the instructor. And um, a lot of times the instructors that I've worked with, especially, especially new, new instructors, which um, for our community college, we end up having a lot of turnover with instructors. And, um, and so working with new instructors, uh, if you've got a bunch of hands that are right in front of you that are coming up, that's what you're going to focus on that's natural. And you're going to feel like you're really reaching everyone because, oh my gosh, look at all these hands that are coming right up right in front of me. But what you're not going to see is the people in the back necessarily um, who, as patterns kind of lay out, um, in, in fact, I, I was working with one instructor um, who, who had kind of uh, two different, the computer, the instructor computer to, to move their slides was in the corner of the room and there were, there were whiteboards on, on the two walls that hit that corner. And so this instructor was really, really proud because they were hitting both of those walls and going back and forth and really feeling like they were all around that classroom. Um, but then when I did an observation like this and I showed them that the opposite corner, the one corner where they never made it to, that was the one area where they had a cluster of minoritized students. And, and that instructor was getting nowhere near them and recognizing that, that though we might not, we as instructors at the front might not recognize the impact there, that students will very much realize this, recognize this, and draw conclusions based on it. Um, conclusions that might not necessarily be true from the intention of the instructor, but is true from their experience in that corner of the room that is not the, uh, you know, kind of, that is not proximal to the instructor. So really recognizing, you know, using a, a, an observation tool similar to this that can really help and highlight for a teacher what the pattern is. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention about this, I don't know if you notice right here in the front of the room, there's a bunch of kind of uh, dashed lines back and forth. Um, that's almost like if any of you are familiar with uh, family circus cartoons, uh, every once in a while they have kind of the dotted lines, the dashed lines of where the kids kind of roamed throughout the house in the neighborhood. Um, this is how on this that we can designate where the instructor was in the, you know, kind of how they moved throughout the class. And so where they were and, and where they weren't, um, you know, kind of during, during the time there. So this can be a really helpful tool um, when talking with other teachers and when other teachers are visiting your class and they can show you, um, you know, kind of uh, how, how your patterns are because it's really hard to, you know, while you're focused on the class to, you know, kind of step out of yourself and, and, and see where you're going. Um, and, and all of this is really important, but in the end, when we're talking about trying to transfer the power in the classroom, um, really what it comes down to is the student contributions and how, um, how, how the students are engaged in the class and recognizing this idea that that it is incumbent on the teacher. The teacher just naturally has the power in the classroom. And so it is incumbent on them to create opportunities. And recognizing that, that merely pausing for 10 seconds to ask, are there any questions? And then moving on is not a, um, it, it's not an authentic opportunity for, uh, for a lot of students to, to participate and, and, to, and to call. Um, as we saw in the observations, and as you can see, once you start noticing these kinds of things, um, in many cases, there are students who will take advantage of that opportunity, but they are um, in a, a vastly uh, majority, the majority race and uh, majority gender is, 
is 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 kind of really what's going to happen more often than not. Um, I, I I put this bullet structure here, really thinking about, and I had one experience where I was observing a, a, a college algebra class, which is one of the uh, lowest pass, it has one of the lowest pass rates in the state for us and, and, and quite possibly in the country. It's, it's kind of the, the, you know, kind of math requirement um, for a lot of students. And so I was visiting this class and I noticed that the teacher was starting out with a whole group and had three or four uh, I think there. I think it was like two females and two male white students right in the front who were just answering every single question, raising their hand all the time. And the, in the back corner, there was a group of four uh, Latin males, uh, Latinos, who who were really disinterested. I mean, they're leaning back in their chair. They're really not engaging at all. Um, and then after the ten minutes, the teacher broke them up into groups and had them working on problems throughout the room, moving throughout the room and working on different problems. It was amazing. It was a complete 180. Now all of a sudden that group of seemingly disinterested students in the back corner were now all about it. I mean, they were, it, other groups, there was maybe one or two students who were like leading the group and other students who were just kind of watching. I mean, that group, Everyone was participating. Everyone was moving around. Everyone was working, and 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 I mean they were getting it right. So that teacher, right? Like, I, and and when I talk to new teachers, that you know, one of the thoughts is, well, if I want to give students an opportunity, and if you know they're not raising their hand to ask questions themselves, maybe I should, I should call on them. Maybe I can, you know, kind of maybe I can pull them in that way, and. Um, and, and there's definitely danger in that, in you know, kind of putting people on the spot and putting people in a, a very uncomfortable situation. And that can really strain our relationship with our students. And so, um, so how can we find an alternative structure, right? How can we provide a, an opportunity that's more authentic? And that teacher had it down. She looked at, you know, she, she made sure that she gave her students who were comfortable in a whole group setting uh, the opportunity to ask questions and, and contribute that way. But then students who maybe were not comfortable in that situation, they could still engage in, uh, in the very next activity and, and get that there. And, and I know um, a lot of teachers, certainly at, at universities and, and in some community colleges, might have larger classrooms, might have you know auditorium seating where it's difficult to kind of move around and to, to have grouping. Um, but I, it is possible and you can you know kind of move, still move throughout an auditorium and require students to um, you know to, to interact with each other and get those you know kind of those group discussions really going. Um, and then finally making sure and recognizing from the teacher's perspective, uh, you know, how we reinforce our students with our feedback and the questions that we ask afterwards and the ways that we react um, when students contribute and, and, and bring in. And so I wanted to kind of end this section with a quote from uh, Dr. Estela Bensimone, who is the uh, founding director of the Center for Urban Education. And I really like, it, this was one of the aspects of working with Q that I really appreciated and um, and I am taking with me uh, for the rest of my career, my teaching career. And um, this quote, basically, I wanted to transform racial equity from an ideal that was embraced in the abstract to something that was actionable and measurable. And so looking at these tools looking at the syllabus, looking at the structure of your course, looking at these obs this observation tool, that those are measurable tools that can then provide teachers with uh, an idea of actions to try in their classroom to really work on bringing all of their students into the environment and um, and, and, and shortening up and, and, and basically um, eliminating those achievement gaps. 
I put just really quickly the general um, website for the Center for Urban Education. If you go to that website, the cue.usc.edu, um, the, the kind of main area right there, it says uh, racial equity tools. And that's where you'll see a lot of, um, you'll see that observation layout. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of tools that they have there that are really, really great for, um, for encouraging this kind of action and, and inquiry from instructors. So thank you very much for, uh, for the time, for allowing me to share. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we have time for a few questions. So let me share my screen here. Um, and I know there were some really great comments in the chat that I would like to um, just acknowledge as well. So there, there was um, a few comments about the, the uh, land that we are all residing on. And I put a link in the chat about how to find whose land we, we are on um, and to acknowledge that. And I, I did fail to do that when we started. So I would like to do that now because I, I am currently occupying the Maidu land in Northern California. And I just want to thank them for for what they have brought to um, to those of us that, that have occupied it. And so thank you for, for that reminder. There were also some um, really great questions about making a syllabus that is both visually appealing and um, accessible. And there are, there are resources for that. There's um, some really great places to find how to make things visual and accessible. And, and it depends on what platform you're using. Um, and so that is something to, to definitely look for. It does take some doing and um, some undoing of the, the normal ways that we're used to creating visuals, but it, it certainly can be done. Um, and there was a question, not a question, but a comment that I just wanted to underline about um, calling office hours student hours. Somebody said they changed the name to student hours, which I thought was such a nice way to reframe um, because indeed the hours are not about being in the office, but about being with the students. So uh, let's see, there was one other question about um, assigning, if, if assigning seats at random or, um, or choosing their own seats. So I think we have just, uh, um, we'll, we'll get to that, but I wanna make sure there was a lot happening in the chat and I wanna make sure I didn't miss anyone's questions. Were there questions earlier that I missed before we get to that one? Um, and then actually there was, uh, so let's do this one. It, it just seemed, are, are the essays in your book um, from multiple years of students or was this the activity of a, a single group of students? I'm Justine, you're, sorry, you're, you're muted. Justine, you're muted. I, sorry. I chose 25 essays out of hundreds, but there's really so much more great material. So, but to answer your question, they're from five years of, of students, but lots of other fantastic essays that I, I didn't put in this particular anthology. And I'm sure we could um, have many books from the stories that your students tell. I, but, the ones that you chose were so moving. So thank you for that. Um, and Michelle, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was interested in that classroom observation worksheet and like how how you would I would get that or something similar or the instructions or whatever. Sure, Michelle. Um, if you if you go to uh, Q's website, so I think it was in the chat earlier, but yeah, there's been a whole bunch of <laughs> chats kind of going through. Um, it's it's basically cue.usc.edu. So uh, it's the Center for Urban Education at usc.edu. Um, they have a list of the different to of of a lot of different tools, and if you it, it, they have actually. Um, a big long uh, document that has a bunch of uh, ideas for observation that has that kind of worksheet, but then also has um, also has kind of ways to uh, to log uh, the type of language that's happening in the class, and you know, kind of 
what types of responses does the instructor have to student comments? Um, you know, are they asking more questions of the students? Are they reinforcing, you know, kind of what the student said? Or are they, you know, kind of bluntly, you know, kind of cutting down any additional discussion, right? Like, and so they're really, they're really interesting um, methods that I certainly hadn't seen before of, you know, kind of ways to, to really get discussion going with, you know, between the observer and the observee and having those, you know, kind of teacher, those pedagogical, um, philosophical discussions, uh, you know, kind of really making those rich and robust and getting, you know, kind of getting your head in that and, and, and uh, Q likes to call it equity mindedness, right? Having that kind of habit of mind of going to, you know, always thinking, oh, wait, what is this? What impact is this going to have on my, uh, my students of color or minoritized students, um, you know? And, and yeah, the, the Q website has lots of really great stuff. Definitely worth, um, worth checking out. And we have just a few more minutes, so I wanted to um, make sure to invite you to our future webinars. Uh, we have one every month. The next one will be on culture shifts and academic freedom. Uh, navigating the virtual open ed conference, which will be very exciting, and uh, tracking key program indicators for OER programs. So lots of really um, great webinars coming up. Uh, thank you for attending this one. This, I, there was a lot of great stuff happening in the chat, so I'm hoping we can have a few more of these um, topics to discuss as well. Also, the um, OE Global 2020 is, um, is happening soon in November. So there's a link here if you want to log, um, sorry, register for it. There's going to be a lot of uh, presentations from all over the world. And I think one of the um, really nice things about the, the conference this year is that it is online, which means we, we can attend for those of us where travel is difficult. So definitely worth checking out. Um, and as far as uh, CCC OER, if you want to stay in, in the loop with us, um, then we have a website. You can join our community email list, which was mentioned a few times earlier. That's um, how I got the, the wonderful list of Heather's resources. And um, that, would, that actually started with a question, right? She posed a question, where can I find images? And that's where we got um, started on that part of the discussion. So definitely a great email group to be a part of. We have our EDI blog. Um, and we're, we're hoping we can convince Justine to, to share a blog post with us as well shortly. Sorry, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, so lots of great stuff on the website. If you have questions, um, Una and Liz are uh, really great contacts to have, as well as uh, Lisa Young and uh, Sue. So with that, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.